So I didn't have any slides. I decided just to, I'll just run you through some things about open property data and be quite quick and then there'll be time for questions. Um, so thanks for inviting me to join you this evening. I'll be talking about why open property data is important for decision making and to enable innovation. Uh, you may think that open data related to the built environment is only relevant to those working in the built environment industry, but when it comes down to it, we all have to make location-based decisions in our lives probably a number of times. Uh, it may be when you're looking for a pro property to buy or rent or an office to work in or a commercial space. Uh, some may want flexible space to live and work in. Some may want to limit their commuting times. Others require local green spaces to walk their dogs and hang out. And others want uh, good access to local schools with good Ofsted ratings. Uh, whether you want to use raw open data to make these decisions or not, you will probably, probably at some point uh, want to use a tool to help inform those location-based decisions. For example, Rightmove and Zoopla are regularly adding more information to their to their offering uh, based on the demand from users that they wanted to be able to easily find uh, the information related to the potential new neighbourhoods on those platforms that they were looking. So information that they're looking for to appear in the place they're looking. Um, so, but there are so many more opportunities for property technology beyond information on property websites. Uh, there's an amazing emerging prop tech market who are innovating new solutions to help overcome wider housing and planning challenges and a plan tech market too that specifically focuses on innovation, innovative solutions for planning and is typically led by innovative local government um, authorities. Um, some of the emerging tools include uh, tools to help SME developers to identify new sites to build new homes and advanced 3D visualisation tools that allow architects to communicate with planning officers and local councillors about uh, potential for new development schemes uh, in the context of other emerging planning permissions. Uh, there are also tools to help policy makers to model scenarios for local infrastructure needs where new housing of is proposed and there are new digital platforms to improve citizen engagement and transparency in local decision making. However, one of the, the big significant barriers to growth, growth of the prop tech sector and delivery of new innovative services for property is the lack of uh, raw open data relating to land, housing and planning. So open data relating to the built environment is typically hard to find, use, understand and trust. And when it is found, it is rarely standardised, which makes it difficult to link to other data sets and build up a holistic picture, both nationally and at a hyper local level. Uh, so a lot of vital data is locked into PDFs or reports rather than accessible as CSV files or GeoJSON files. For example, it's difficult to tell a national story about housing by using open data alone, as much as it is difficult to tell a story about a single property or place that someone may have an interest in. Uh, there are over about 360 independent variables um, that can be attributed to the built environment, uh, ranging from the things that we can see to the things we cannot see. And it's that rich tapestry of ingredients and how they interrelate that makes every village, town and city so unique and no two places are the same. Um, so there is a need now more than ever to increase access to open data and unique open identifiers related to land, housing and planning to inform decision making for everyday people, uh, to policy makers and to enable greater innovation. At the moment, it's taken a resource of innovative startups to mine data and standardise it rather than being freed up to be really innovative and build new technology and use artificial intelligence and machine learning and natural language processing. Um, with planning data, for example, which is an important component, component of property data, uh, there are over 375 local planning authorities who are, all record planning information in different ways and do not use common schemas or linked identifiers to record their decisions. Uh, therefore, it's really difficult to uh, relate planning data to a specific property or street and a lot of data is locked behind licensing. Um, 
So the role of the digital land team. So we exist to improve access to land, housing and planning data by creating a trusted data infrastructure that will operate as an open data platform. Uh, this involves an iterative and user-centered approach to designing new data standards and removing policy barriers. We want to support an ecosystem of public and private sector tools to emerge uh, that are interoperable to help uh, offer solutions to um, housing and planning challenges. Uh, it's no small task and to do it well it takes time to create the right data standards which need to be designed, tested and implemented. Our three main user groups are local government, policy makers and PropTech. By using, focusing on the open data needs of those three user groups, we seek to reach the wider needs of SME developers, planners and citizens who are all the end users and beneficiaries of the new services that will be built. Um, so you may have seen a recent announcement from the Geospatial Commission that UPRN and USRN identifiers are going to be opened under open government license. Um, UPRNs, also known as the acronym for unique property reference numbers and USRNs are unique street reference numbers. Um, yep, they'll be released from July 2020. Um, they are really significant because they are unique identifiers which will allow the key data sets to be linked geospatially. Um, it's been a really long running cross government program led by the Geospatial Commission and is an example of where there was a need for cross government policy to resolve licensing barriers to allow their publication as open data. This was something that really mattered to us and um, prop tech users we're always requesting this this data set and something that we've really been pushing for internally i'm so glad to see it over the line and uh, their opening will be transformative in terms of being able to link key data sets relating to the built environment um, so for example properties planning and places will be able to be easily mapped and layers layered so what next uh, we will continue to work Cross government uh, to improve access to much needed open data and to build a trusted data infrastructure for built environment data as an open platform. Um, this would be through the work of the digital land team. We'll also continue to work on policy matters that are related to that, uh, continue to work with the prop tech sector to, to support them to innovate and listen to their data needs. And we'll continue to support the emergent plan tech sector, mainly led by innovative local planning authorities to help scale the ecosystem. Um, our understanding is that a, a robust open data platform for built environment data will enable innovation and will support a new ecosystem of interoperable digital services from the public and private sector to emerge to benefit everyone from home buyers, renters and developers to local government policy makers and communities. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you very much, Natalie. Uh, and congratulations on um, getting the UPRNs and USRNs open from July. Um, I, I, we've definitely got some questions coming in, rushing in. In fact, um, I've got a, I've got a question um, which um, might might be a toughie. Uh, what are the challenges associated with getting local government to adopt data standards? Yeah, I think. Um... Something we really understand with local government is that different, well, particularly local planning authorities, um, there are different levels of di digital capability in the teams and resources. Um, and so we really work to help local authorities and work with them to understand their needs. And uh, for example, our local digital fund has uh, enabled uh, local government to, to, to bid for uh, where they want to do some digital transformation projects and uh, they've been able to bid for funding for that and that's and also the all the results of that and their findings are released in the open and so other local authorities may be looking um, to also innovate and to share and build upon the experience of others so uh, we really try and support we have a call with lots of local government digital people uh, which everyone's invited to uh, once a week and we hear the needs of different local authorities and just trying to support that network and ecosystem 
but it is about iteratively designing and um and sort of we don't want to just rush with the data standard that doesn't work for local government and is a burden so uh, we test it and and design it around um our our users um, thank you. Uh, a question from uh, Owen Boswarva on Twitter. Um, do you think EPRNs are going to be credible as an open standard for prop tech um, without having the address information, the identifiers reference uh, open as well? Yeah, really good question. I am. Um, I've spoken. We speak a lot to prop tech users and companies, and um, there's a lot of excitement about about their release um, it's understood that um, without the geography they're still hugely useful um, and and what what is exciting is that they'll emerge in after July 2020 in forthcoming data sets relating to housing land and planning so moving forward uh, they'll appear in those data sets so yeah a lot of excitement from um, our prop tech users a uh, question from George Graham. Uh, what's the overlap between the uh, digital land team in MHCLG and the land registry uh, and their drive for digital registers, uh, their local yeah. land charges register, and their work with the Ordnance Survey on Geovation with PropTech? It sounds like there's a lot uh, going on in this space, potentially duplication. Yeah, so we. Uh... We work with land registry on their local land charges. We're sort of closely aligned with them. We, un, you know, we know about their forthcoming programs and try to support them in that, in in all their projects, like they try to support us in ours. So, um, we we all sort of share. Um, we get together and share uh, which projects we're working on and whether there are interdependencies. We um we discuss those and there's policy. Uh, interdependencies as well so um yeah there's there is a lot in this space but we we are joined up and uh, the geospatial commission have the geo6 and um so we work closely with the Geos geospatial commission on housing land and pl planning projects as well so yeah thank you and a question from uh, terence eden uh, which other countries are doing interesting things with this sort of data yeah, good question. So I think um, New South Wales in Australia, um, as a state, they um, they they're, they're sort of quite forward thinking in the digital planning space. And we've got uh, we we had a visit from from a minister there who was keen to see how we were doing digital planning. And um, yeah, we share knowledge with with different people around the world who are doing. Uh, innovative things with digital planning in in particular and open data um i hear canada's working on it too uh, but yeah mainly with our australian counterparts great thank you very much i think that's all the questions that we have for oh, now um, question um new york are doing cool things with uh, their planning labs as well so that's one to look for Cheers, thank you very much. And in fact, there is a final question which um, I missed from Pauline Roche um, many, uh, many minutes ago. And actually, I'm going to just um, open it up to all three speakers to answer if um, if they've got an answer for it or not, if they don't. Um, would we say that the UK government is releasing less open data than it has before? And are there good examples of local government doing better? If I could hop in on the second part of that question, um, I, I've just been—I've only been in the Ministry of Housing for for a year, but I've just been blown away by the amount of local authorities who are being innovative and just wanting to experiment locally and and actively seeking us out to to show us what they're doing and to get support and um yeah there's there's a lot of cool examples um there hopefully well we'll put some links up on our website soon to but uh, if you go to the local digital collaboration unit you'll see some examples there
Great, thank you very much. Uh, Ian, this was this was a question directed to you, which you're more than welcome to answer if you if you've got a good answer for the first part. Um, um thank you. Um I guess my my field of vision in this has been pretty much looking at Scotland of late for the last couple of years, rather than more broadly. Um so I so I can certainly say that um the the programme for the seven cities of Scotland, the seven local authorities, of which one I think is dropped out, but essentially the six major cities, is still pushing forward. I think it's it's not really had the momentum we hoped it would be, but there are some good things going on. Um, and certainly Stirling, uh, Perth and Dundee out of those seem to be making some good headway. Um, and similarly, I mentioned before, the, you know, the, from Scottish Government, their statistics authority do some really, or the statistics divisions do some really good work. Um, and Marine Scotland and some other parts of uh, SEPA and things, Scottish Environment Protection Agency, some some good things certainly. Great, thank you. Uh, and final, final, final question for Natalie um, from Peter Bell: uh, Have you heard about uh, what three words dot com and their Ooh. mission to give? Three minutes square, um, a unique name, and what do you think of it? Ah, uh, tricky question. I know it's contentious. Um, um, I I don't know how to answer this one. So. <laughs> no worries. Did anyone else want to hop in? It's it's not something I'm um, fond of. Let's put it that way. Yeah, I, I, certainly, I certainly wouldn't like to see public money being spent um, on using it, which I think it is as well. So. Yeah, so it's it's a proprietary system. It's not open. Um, if you want a really good uh, review of it, I would look at Terence Eden's blog posts, um, uh, which he points out a whole range of issues with it. I, I've, I've also blogged about it in the past around some of the problem problematic aspects of how it's um, how it's licensed, so I would say approach with caution. Yeah. Thank you. And, and this really is the last question, but it's a good one, so um, I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, looking at this, Anthony Harrison, uh, uh, looking at my local council, a lot of data hasn't been updated for many years. Uh, how can we incentivize councils to keep their open data up to date, published, and maintained? Yeah, it's a really good question and something we think about a lot, especially in work related to the digital transformation of planning. Um, it has to, yeah, I think by designing good data schemas, it will make it easier for local authorities to update their data. And, and we're seeing that with Brownfield land registers. So we've redesigned the data schema um, to for local authorities to publish their brownfield land registers and um and just the improvement in in the quality of the data we've received since updating that data standard to make it more simplified and to improve the guidance around it we've seen a, a much a greatly improved uh, feedback on, on that and uh, much more usable data so i think yeah Good, well-designed data standards will will help with local authorities, so it's not a won't be a burden for them to to update their data. 